So I thought I'd reintroduce our old friend to the bag of sugar. So one of the comments on that we made a video about masses and things and weights. One of the comments asked what the on the next to one kilogram what the little e means, which I didn't actually know. So I went and looked it up, and it turns out it just means that the mass is estimated, which kind of makes sense, right? Because actually a bag of sugar is never going to be exactly a kilogram because you know well this one's got a leak apart from anything else, so the odd grain's going to get out. But you never define things to be you know exactly one kilogram. So which got me to thinking about what actually defines a kilogram. And it's a bit timely too, because it seems likely that the definition of a kilogram is actually about to disappear, not just to change, but to disappear entirely. The kilogram will no longer be defined. There is currently a piece of precious metal, which was made in London, but is stored in Paris in a vault, in a vacuum, and it's never looked at, well, it's looked at a few times a year, I think, and very rarely taken out, which is the official definition of the kilogram, which is sort of a bit of an anachronism in that, so, well, I guess we need to do a little bit of history. We back up to the beginning. The SI unit was defined, and it was actually defined, the meter, for example, was defined to be one ten millionth the distance from the North Pole to the equator going through Paris. So you can tell who invented this particular system of units. Okay, that was the original definition of the meter. And then everything kind of flowed from that, in that a litre of water was defined to be a tenth of a metre by a tenth of a metre by a tenth of a metre. And if you then took a litre of water, four degrees centigrade and distilled water and so on, that was the definition of a kilogram. And so the definitions all kind of flow from that and then you needed a second as well, but that's sort of defined in terms of astronomy things, the calendar, the length of the year and so on, so that gives you a second. Those were the original definitions, but it's not very practical in that if you actually want to measure a metre, it's not very handy to have to measure the distance from the North Pole to the equator through Paris every time you want to figure out how long a metre is. And so quite quickly the definition of, the official definition of the metre changed from being that to being the length of a particular rod also stored in a vault in Paris. And the definition of the kilogram was defined to be a particular mass that was stored in the vault in, in Paris. I mean, again, that, although that's a kind of now an, a clear definition, it's not very helpful because it, you then have to go to a vault in Paris every time you want to know what a kilogram is. And so obviously, the, you know, they deal with that. For, for example, the kilogram, they made lots of copies of it. The copies got sent around the world. But one of the things they found is that they don't all stay the same mass. So one of the things they do when they compare these kilogram standard masses against each other, they find that actually they don't all have the same mass anymore. And in particular, the one that's stored in the vault in Paris has lost mass relative to the ones that are stored elsewhere. Or probably more likely, the ones that are stored elsewhere have actually gained mass because actually they're handled more and they're more in the air and so on. So atoms stick to them and bits of you know, muck stick to them and so on. So over time, they'll drift in, in mass. And that's not, that, it's not a helpful way of having your units defined. So actually you need something kind of more fundamental. The meter, the official meter is no longer that rod. That disappeared some considerable time ago. Now the official meter is defined in terms of a distance that light travels in one 299,792,458th of a second. Okay, is the official definition of the meter. Um, and that's where we are with that. And that's more fundamental and more helpful because actually that's in terms of a fundamental physical constant, right? That's in terms of the speed of light. And so, for example, if we were to discover life on Alpha Centauri and we wanted to kind of send messages to them about things we'd measured, we could actually explain to them what a meter was in terms of something that they could measure, which you couldn't do if it was just the length of a ruler in a bank vault somewhere. Um, but the kilogram, at the moment, we're still stuck with this weight um, in the bank vault. And so, actually, you can't explain to somebody over the phone what a kilogram is or, you know, by radio telescope or whatever it is, you can't explain what a, what a kilogram actually is. And so partly motivated by the fact that it's sort of hard to reproduce and partly motivated by making it sort of a bit more fundamental, there's a move to change the definitions of all the fundamental units in, so that instead of defining our units in terms of things, we define them in terms of the fundamental constants. And then, so then at the moment, for example, Planck's constant, for example, is measured. You know, we define our units and then we make some careful experiment using those units and then we could say what our measured value of Planck's constant is. But, a, but an alternative way of defining the units is doing it the other way around. You define the value of Planck's constant and then that in turn will then define the units that come from, from there. Um, so there's a move afoot in the next few years to change these definitions. How the kilogram is going to be done, there's still, I believe there's still some competition. There's either going to be some exact number of silicon atoms is one way of doing it. But I think the front runner now is actually you throw out the kilogram entirely as a fundamental unit and your units then become things like Planck's constant, the speed of light, Boltzmann's constant and those kinds of things. And from those it turns out you can construct what a kilogram has to be. I mean in terms of its value, 
it would still be almost exactly the same. In fact, it would by definition because you define it. You know, you take the you, at the moment we define the kilogram, we measure the, the the constants of nature as best we possible can, and we get values for them. What they would do is they would take those values. They would then be defined as you know Planck's constant would be exactly equal to this, rather than it's measured to be this plus or minus a little bit. And then from that, you could then figure out what a kilogram was. And of course, because we're using the same numbers, you'd actually end up with a kilogram, which is kind of indistinguishable from you know, the kilograms that we have today. The issue here is, is how do you actually do this, right? And so there are, there are a number of fundamental quantities that get defined. And so just, this is just to show you that you can actually, when you define these fundamental quantities, you can put them together to figure out what a kilogram has to be. One of the quantities that gets defined, you need a, something to define time with, and you actually define a frequency, mu zero, and this is the frequency of radio waves given out by a particular atom in a particular transition. So it's, an, a, it's not, in some sense, a fundamental constant of nature, but it's something that any, anyone would agree anywhere in the world or in the universe, if they took the relevant atoms of cesium and made this measurement of this particular frequency, it would oscillate nine billion times a second or thereabouts, and that would give you a, a, a frequency measurement, which you can clearly then defer to turn into a time. Right? It's doing this many times per second, so if we just wait till it's done, it's nine billion oscillations, that's one second of That's duration. how atomic clocks work, isn't it? It is how atomic clocks work, and it's a very stable way of doing things. Okay, so that's, that's one of the, the new definitions. The second possible thing that we would define is Planck's constant, which is to do with the, the quanta of nature, and one of the, th the third thing we might want to define is the speed of light. So as I say, at the moment, both these things are just measured, as indeed is this frequency, but we could actually just define them. And now we can start putting things together. So we have a cesium atom, it goes through this transition, it emits a photon of light with that frequency, then we can figure out the energy of that photon, it's just e equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon being emitted. Okay, that's just Planck's law for figuring out the energy of a photon when you know its frequency. So that's now an energy. And you might imagine, and again, this is just a, not an experiment that anyone would ever do in practice, but you might imagine, okay, so let's take that energy and turn it into a mass. And again, we use one of the other very famous equations of physics, which is this is the energy we've got to play with, and we can turn that into a mass through Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Okay, and so now we know what the mass we would turn that photon into. Its mass would just be equal to, we arrange in this equation, Planck's constant, which is now just defined to be something times this frequency, which we've defined, divided by the speed of light squared, which is defined. So that means that the mass we will get out of this entirely impractical experiment is completely defined in terms of the, the quantities that we've already defined. And then we just say, okay, so if we take however many trillion of those little masses, we could stick them together to make a kilogram. And there's no freedom there anymore. The, the, the mass of the kilogram is completely defined in terms of these fundamental quantities of nature. You're talking as though Planck's constant and the speed of light and these other fundamental constants, we don't quite know what they are. No. So if later on we find we got them a bit wrong... But we won't find we got them a bit wrong because we've defined them to be these particular values. And all that would happen is then the length of the metre would change by a tiny, tiny fraction or the mass of a kilogram would change by a tiny, tiny fraction because they are no longer defined quantities. So if it's some clever, more clever experiment relating the length of a ruler to Planck's constant comes along later on, we won't show in the past what would have happened is we'd have changed Planck's constant. So we got the measurement of Planck's constant a bit a little bit wrong. Now we'll just say, oh, we got the definition of the meter a little bit wrong and we'll change the meter by a tiny fraction. But Planck's constant at the speed of light, they're, they're exactly equal to those quantities. And all that will happen if the, some subsequent measurement changes is that that will change the length of the meter or the kilogram. I mean, it's, it, you know, for everyday purposes, it really doesn't matter because these quantities are sufficiently well known that any subsequent measurements are only going to change things by the tiniest of amounts. But they are more fundamental constants of nature, so it's nice to have them not changing and change the length of the meter or the mass of the kilogram instead because they are in some sense less fundamental. It, yeah, but the, you know, the trouble with the romance is it sometimes gets in the way of science, and I think this is one of those cases where, yes, having that romantic definition is, is, is unhelpful to the scientists.